for you. All righty. So we oops, love to have participation. It's always great when we've got questions to. Right. I think so yeah. too. I think so too. <laughs> yeah. So Karen, is there something you want to start off? So, or should I just start asking you some questions? Um, if we have questions then that'd be great. I'll start there. But otherwise I'm on my mind today is helping children to um, build resilience. I think Ooh, this, I love that. Tell us I more. I really need to be thinking very closely about children and their resilience. Yeah. All right. So tell us what, what about that and um, how can, can, how can we help and support our children around that? Yeah. So, so I, I think what's surfacing for in a lot of households um, is that children now are in the stage of sort of reality in a sense, this is a term that I'm hearing. I don't know that I embrace the term so much, but you know, we're, we're, we're in for the long haul. We've been in for a long haul, longer than we anticipated, right? Initially when, when um, children went out of school and out of their, their, um, you know, their karate classes and their ballets and, and so on and so forth, they thought this is a little bit of time, two weeks, I think was what a lot of people were saying. And then that two weeks grew to four weeks. And now, you know, I'm hearing that, that a lot of things are going to be closed for a long time. Um, and so I am concerned about helping children get, 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 get through this and, and learn more about themselves. Um, uh, there, there's milestones, right, that now are coming to, that everybody's coming to question. I'm sorry, I'm getting lots of texts coming in all of a sudden. Um, uh, graduation, communion, bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs. Uh, maybe somebody was going to be a flower girl in a wedding uh, or a ring bearer or, you know, th things like that. Um, we've gone beyond the birthdays and the drive by and honk and wave. We're getting into some bigger, bigger moments. Uh, and I think that this is going to call for us to really watch our children, help them to understand and, and build some resilience around the disappointments they're going to feel. Very powerful disappointments. And how can we address those? So I think the, the, the most important thing is, again, what I always say is the conversation, right? So having conversations with your children, but also watching them and trying to better understand the reactions and the things that are happening from day to day. So a child who maybe is becoming increasingly angry um, and is expressing it through angry words or reluctance to do work or um, the child who's becoming more removed and maybe spending more time in their room or in their playroom uh, instead of with parents. The child who um, is outbursting, temper tantruming, not sleeping. You know, these, these we would call, you know, we would look at it like that's the reluctant child, that's the defiant child, that's the difficult child but maybe not, maybe that child is in his, her, their own way um, expressing this, this disappointment, this confusion, this feeling of um, sadness. And I think the first thing we need to do is, is look closely, step back and not immediately define it, but try and, as I always say, collect the data and try and better understand it. And then the next thing to do is to open up a dialogue and help a child, you know, when I feel upset, when I feel disappointed, when I feel sad, what, what works for me? How can we figure that out as a family, as, you know, parent and child, or even if that doesn't work, then who do I bring into the child's circle that I know, you know, will, will be able to connect with that my child will be able to connect with? Is it an aunt? Is it the neighbor? Is it the grandparent? Who is it that needs to be more closely involved in this moment where the parent says, look, this is what I'm saying. This is what I'm thinking. I'm not 100% sure, but you connect with my child. Can you please reach out? And those, those are some of the immediate things, um, but I'd like to hear from our audience what they're, how, the, how this is resonating with them. Well, I love that. So please use the chat feature if you're connected on the um, webinar platform. If you are on Facebook, and I, that's I, I, I look down, I'm looking at Facebook <laughs> and seeing if people connected and keeps coming up and some hearts popping up too. Um, please ask your questions. And so before we start heading, I know there's a little bit of delay in the video. 
Uh, I love the example you gave, of, all right, maybe it is connecting with somebody else in the family or loved ones or friends that can, you know, maybe talk to um, the children and even um, ad adolescents, I think you mm -hmm. say in English. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, what are other tools and hacks that you've seen? Because I know you, you, I love that you're a big proponent of asking questions, you know, um, ask questions, find out from uh, your children what they need and what what their desires are and what their challenges are sometimes it's it's good to borrow and yes. to have to like spark ideas yeah. so what are yeah. your, your so i think the other piece is is creating um networks for yourself as a parent so you know you have a group of friends that you have been socializing with and you often share parenting stories with maybe around dinner you go out to dinner or maybe you go to get a cup of coffee or something of that this is the time to keep those connections alive this is an, a moment where they already know you you already know them you probably know their children they know your children this is a time to continue those conversations what are you seeing? How are you dealing with? This is what's happening in my house. And because of this, this sort of knowledge of each other prior to this situation, uh, you, your trusted friends can now help you to analyze what you're going through or to just say, hey, I had the same thing in my house and I tried this and it worked. I tried this and it didn't work, but it might work in your house. <laughs> you know, but, but those dialogues need, they need to be happening now. Uh, more so than ever. And I think as we're, as, as you're called to parent and to spend so much time with your children and then try and juggle work and so on and so forth, you're probably stepping away from some of those relationships. This is a time to step into them. I love that to create a network and, and we've seen so many people connecting and having like cocktail hours on zoom and all of that. Why not have like parents cocktail hour where the kids sure. see is like, all right, what are your hacks? What are you doing? And how can we yeah. support each other through this? Yeah, connect hack? with intention, connect with intention that goes beyond. Let's just, you know, mix this drink and sit and have a chat, which is all really swell. You know, it's nice, but, but maybe the few of those have to be with more intention. I love that. Connect with intention. Fantastic. And so we have um, a comment on our webinar platform. Um, hi, Diana. Um, commenting, saying, you know, um, it's so important to observe, watch, and listen. Children have so many ways to communicate. So important to learn on your, uh, lean on your network. So 100%. Um, so beautifully said. Anything else you'd like to add on here? I'm looking at, um, can you ask? Ooh, I love this question. So we have an next question. Great question, Clayton, on Facebook. I love it. So on this topic, is there something else you'd like to add or should we move on to the next question? Um, we can move on to the next question. That's fine. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so Clayton asks, can you ask how to maintain connections while limiting screen time? Oh, <laughs> yes, I, it's a I challenge. love that question. Yeah. And it is really a challenge. I mean, I think, you know, I see situations in, in homes where people are texting each other inside their house, <laughs> you know, uh, and I think that should, that should cease if at all possible. And I think the, the family meal around the table is important right now. Game night, movie night. Um, wonderful stories of parents who are pulling out movies that were important to them uh, in the 80s and the 90s and playing them with their children, showing them to their children and talking about their life experience when these movies were playing um, and where they were in their lives. Um, so I think within the household, this is easy. This, is, this can definitely be done and it needs quality time. It needs thought and needs intention purpose. Uh, Otherwise you have people huddled in the corners of the house and texting each other. So in that sense, I think you can reduce screen time. Screen time otherwise is tough. I mean, you can make a phone call uh, and people have moved away from phone calls, but, but there's something about for, you know, it's interesting that, that this is asked because for some kids, the combination of the visual and the audio um, is good. And for others, it's overstimulation. 
And so for some kids, a phone call would be better than the face-to-face. -face. Uh, and I think that's true for all of us. I prefer a phone call to a text message any day of the week. <laughs> call me up. I have other people like will text me say, can I call you? And I have found myself falling into that habit. Can I call you? Instead of just calling, we used to just pick up the phone and call. And now it's almost like we need permission to call. <laughs> but I think the surprise phone call, I think the letter in the mail. So I know some of my teachers have been drawing and writing cards and sending, to the, sending them to the children in the mail. That is huge. It's hugely um, effective. Um, uh, a little, you know, a little token, something, even if it's something from your house to someone else's house, it's a wonderful thing. Um, so that's another way to do it. You know, I think it's a challenge. It's it's a great question. It's something to, that I have to kind of look through. But, you know, I think also that all of us like to go to Google to find an answer to a problem that we have. And although that, that serves well in some cases, in some cases it limits our thinking. I will just go and find the answer to my problem instead of I will sit with my problem, I will analyze, listen, and collect the data, and then make some decisions on my own about my problem. So that would reduce screen time if people would just sit in their own minds and with their partners and with their friends uh, and, and figure out how to come to some of you know, the, some of the, the tools and, and approaches and tactics that we need to get through this. I love that, to sit around and brainstorm, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I love that. Um, and I wanna to touch on something you said about overstimulation, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think that's so interesting. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, just, I just, um, I mean, we all have, have the ways in which we feel most comfortable. Um, communicating with other people. And again, I just think for some people, the, the visual and the audio, audio is too much. And also there's some apprehension. If I'm gonna be on the screen, then I have to have a particular appearance. My hair has to be done, I have to be out of my pajamas. I, you know, uh, maybe I have to dress from the waist up and some people are doing that. Um, but I, I think that it takes away the pressure of, you know, of having to consider that and have the anxiety around that. So, um, and, and just true for some, for some kids that it's, it's too much, it's too much to manage. And the other part of it is that when you have the visual and the audio, sometimes you can, um, kids will get distant from it. So, you know, you'll see them playing and they're, they're running from it and, and, and you, you then get frustrated, right? I, I made this time to be connected with you and you're not making the time for me. And then there's a level of frustration and anxiety between people. So sometimes just the singular, just the phone call is, is easier all around. It requires a little bit more focus and attention. I love that. And uh, Amanda saying, waste up for sure. Uh, <laughs> definitely business on top, party in the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so much yeah. fun. Yeah. And um, thank you so much for, for the comments. I'm just reading on some here as well. I love um, Adam says, great distinctions uh, between screen time and face to face and the auditory, auditory learners of simple phone call and love the letters, the handwritten letters, oh, such gosh. a beautiful idea. Yeah. Do you have other, t other activities like that that we can do from all ages that are not screen time, but they're also, you know, they're taking up our time. I know you, you mentioned some ideas on the previous call. There are, are there others, especially I think we talked about being out in the garden and being outdoors. Yes. Is there something that we can do indoors? Yeah, outdoors is always valuable, um, and I think it's a, a change of venue that's necessary every day. Um, in indoors, I mean, the other thing, you know, getting back to sort of resilience and feelings, and how do I feel? How you know when I feel upset or when I feel disappointed? You know, I have a thought that it would be fun to create in households um, some kind of visual piece that the child can. Um, you know, an art piece, right? That says, okay, so when I feel, when I feel disappointed, I, and it could be almost like icons, right? Because now our children have, are so familiar with icons. So could they create icons? You know, 
I take a walk, I pet the dog, I paint, I uh, build a tent in the living room and, and shelter in, I, you know, so on and so forth. And almost like it then becomes a resource for the child and for the parent to help remind the child. But I think it's important to par do that par in parallel. So the parents should also be doing one for, for themselves. So um, that everybody maybe in the house has not when I feel whatever, you know, when I feel worried, when I feel upset, when I feel disappointed, I do these things and it's colorful. Um, it could be drawn. It could be images cut out of magazines. Um, it certainly could be things you print, but then again, you have screen time. Uh, but I think building that resource in parallel is important. And I say in parallel because children, um, we validate to some degree, right, the tools that they use. So by making it for ourselves as well, we're saying this is an important tool. This is a tool that people use. I love that. I love the, the visual, the when I, mm, I do. And Karen, I must say, I am so excited. We have so much amazing engagement on Facebook and on Zoom. So thank you so much for your Hi. question, guys. I'm going to be, if I ha we haven't asked your question yet, I will be asking it. Um, so here are some of the questions. So do you have a book club for parents, teachers, or children that you know of? I have a book club. Oh, that's a good one. Or where to um, find one. Or it could, you know what I love about these questions too, Karen, is, and the fact that you'll be here next week is if we don't know, we will tune into next week's call and we will give you the answers. Yeah. So I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I'm not thinking of anything immediately, although the first thing that comes to mind is why not create a book club? Why not create a book club? So your children have a circle of friends and I would send out a little, um, however you communicate, right? Uh, maybe it's a message, maybe it's an email, maybe it's a phone call and say, what what give me your top three books what three books would you would you choose to read right now and then see if there's any similarity among the books if not survey again and say here's the books that we've been given pick the top three and or pick your first one um and settle on a book and then maybe what you do is you rotate the read aloud if the children can read or you do the read aloud so that you host a meeting and everybody comes and you read the book together. And you know, you bring your hot chocolate or your tea or, or your lunch and, and, you, and you read together. I think it'd be great for, for, for um, parents and, and even older children to host for younger children book clubs. Be an awesome, I love awesome that. way to That's connect. That's a great idea. Yeah. But I will look it up. There are, there are book clubs that I will find for people. All right, so stay tuned. Make sure if you're listening to us on Facebook, sign up at www.hackmankind.com. You'll get our schedule. First 1,000 people to sign up. You are having our founders free access. So it's a, um, you'll be joining that first group of people that have free access to all our material that we are doing on the panel with calls, et cetera, and then angel calls every day. So please head on over there. And Karen will come back to us next week around this time. Uh, thank you so much, Karen. You're so full of incredible knowledge. And I, I keep hearing all these uh, beautiful um, comments. But I'll jump quickly to the next question. How do you decide between importance of routine and allowing more a free flowing go with with it type of day. Right. Right. I mean, how do you how I think there's a blend. I think there has to be a blend. So um first of all, it's it's great to start your day with routine. And I think within each family you should come up with some agreements around routines. And for me, the important thing is getting up and getting ready, whether that means you know, taking a shower, changing from your pajamas to your clothing or, or making your bed. Um, but there should be a routine that, that starts the day. And it may even be in your home an hour by which you would like to have everybody up and going. Um, I think that this is a personal and a household decision. It isn't a personal decision so much as it is a household decision. And some things will be dictated by necessity. Uh, so I don't want to, I don't want to kind of Put that on anybody but i think that we all need downtime we all need kind of 
let's see what happens, you know. Um, uh, and, 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 and time by ourselves as well. So I like, I've heard a lot of stories about kids just pushing furniture together and building tents and crawling in. Um, and sometimes they want to be alone and sometimes a, a parent is welcomed in or a sibling is welcomed in, uh, creating cozy spots and things like that, I think should, should happen. Uh, take some natural, have some natural flow. Um, but I, but maybe there's routines around meals. So you know that everybody's eating well and you touch base with each other. Um, maybe there's routines around the schoolwork that has to be done. Um, but I, I, it, for me, an essential piece is reading the mood and the moment and trying not to get into headstrong battles. You know, you may think that it's time to do math and your child may think it's time to crawl into the tent. <laughs> and you may, you, may, you may say, okay, you know what? I'll compromise with you. We'll, we'll crawl into the tent and we'll do math. And then I'll leave and you can make the tent bigger or I'll give you an extra blanket or you know, something that acknowledges the need for that space, that created space, that created time. Um, I, I also think it is important though, that when there are things that are imperative to the parent, that there has to be some agreements around that. You know, it is imperative for me to be on a call from nine to 11, for instance, and talking about that the day before and what that's going to look like and what your child is going to be doing and maybe even setting it up um, is, is important and you know building those making making the possibility of success making success as you know as possible as i'm not coming up with the right words but making setting yourself up for success and setting your child up for success right is going to ultimately um be a win for everyone and so i i think that that's also essential i don't think there's a there's a firm answer to this because i don't live in every person's house but i do feel very strongly that it's not worth arguing it's not worth arguing so if you can if you can uh give notice in a sense have time to negotiate to to come to some agreements if you can be somewhat flexible um I'm going to use an example of uh, that was given to me uh, by one of the people on this call. You know, you you go outside and you're gonna you're gonna water all the plants, and the next thing you know, you're watering the sidewalk. Is that okay? You know, I think that's okay. You got to take a deep breath. You know, not worry about the wasted water. Not worry about what your intention was versus the child's direction, and just go with it. Maybe start splashing in it. You know, maybe start spraying it. I don't know. <laughs> you know, make it fun make it fun, make it okay, put it aside, you know, take the preconceived notions and set them aside for a moment and just breathe. Okay, what do I do in this moment? It's not the way I thought it was gonna be. It's not within our routine. I love that. And thank you so much, Peter, for that question. If you want to have more details, please let me know or put your, unmute your um, microphone. Um, but in the meantime, I would love to read on Facebook we have um, Jeff, hi Jeff. Um, he says, so glad that he caught this episode this morning and he's always been a big proponent on working with his son on learning and developing learning skills and passion through curiosity. And I love what um, yes. you're saying, Jeff. Karen also said, you know, always have fun, a fun, fun, fun. And now has been quite a more challenging time uh, supplementing it through online learning from home has kind of become primary and he's working on developing all of this. However, it's also challenging uh, facet worth with the co-parenting and managing uh, opinions on screen time, outdoor versus indoor activity versus social time. Um, yeah. How do you, what would you say for parents who um, are co-parenting or sometimes even separated, what, what's your advice? Yeah, this is a tough one. So co-parenting um, takes in, in any situation, right? It's, it's the greatest challenge of parenting is that you, you're potentially not the only parent. <laughs> there may be two of you, there may be three of you, there may be four of you with, with, with um, you know, with, uh, with marriages and, and remarriage and so on and so partners and new partners. And um, so I like to think that we could be adult about this 
and have some conversations and have some agreements around um, how we're doing. How are we doing? So if we all were, were taking our, setting our sights on the child instead of our own ego and our own needs and our own difficulties, we would probably be a, a, better teams, better teams, right? So taking that team mentality, we are a team in this and uh, we are coaching, mentoring, teaching, raising our child, uh, we would probably be more open to the conversations that need to happen. And, 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 no, and also we would get to know each other better and know when to step in and help, when to step back and take a deep breath and put your anxiousness aside and let the, let your partner do what they're doing. Um, you know, assuming it does no harm. Um, and, and then revisit it later. You know, when you did this, it was really hard for me uh, because I saw the situation differently or I didn't, I didn't see that as the most important thing to press upon. And if you can have those open conversations, not, they're not easy, certainly. Um, definitely gonna bump heads sometimes, but always remembering we are here for this child. We both love this child. This is, you know, this is where our passion is. Um, I, I just think that the result is easier. That doesn't always happen and there's conflict. And so I think in the course of conflict, you have to stand within your own truth and you have to, in a sense, mitigate the damage or balance the other person, um, provide a different perspective maybe, um, but I think each of us as a parent has to stay in our own truth and do the very best we can with, you know, an open heart and an open mind. Thank you. That's so beautiful. And, and I hope we're answering your questions. If at any point you feel like you want to ask something more or it sparks something, please don't hesitate. Put it in the comments and um, on the Q&A. It actually uh, makes it easier if you do go on to www hackmankind.com and you go on the link because there will be a Q and A and it's, it's a lot um, clearer to distinguish questions versus comments. So head on over there and make sure that your question will get answered during the, during these live calls or can Karen can then also do some research and come back to us on the next yeah. call. Like yeah. we do have a follow-up question as well, right here on the uh, webinar software. And Amanda asked, I love your questions from last week about your mention from last week about using the phone or video call as a way to give reprieve to parents. What do you recommend for families that have children with special needs? This is a very tough situation and so many children and uh, parents are, well, so many parents are feeling frustrated right now because this, for a lot of these children, this online connection is not working. You know, it's not meaningful. And so parent really does have to jump in at home uh, to support their children with special needs. Um, and there's some, uh, some people are getting better at this. So, so I'm hearing a few more stories about children who have had regular therapy, who were left in the lurch without any, um, now receiving this therapy uh, through um, Zoom meetings and other digital meetings. Um, the parent still needs to be beside the child and needs to be very involved in the, in the, um, in the service that's being provided. But I'm hearing more and more success stories. So I feel like we're, we're working out some of the kinks, um, but, now more than ever that the parent of a child with special needs has got to be present in tune and prepared. And so it's a matter of going back and thinking about what's, what, what was being done with your child? What were those therapies? Can you do any of them? Can you provide activities that, that enhance, you know, an, uh, OT and, and speech and uh, PT, um, I don't have a solid answer for this. It's something that I worry about. 
Um, it's something that I talk to our parents about uh, who have children enrolled in our school and are struggling with this. We do do, uh, we have children with dyslexia and we are providing online um, uh, Wilson reading training and it's actually going very well. Uh, so we're, we're proud of that. Um, but in all honesty, I think that the education system has lost its way on how to, how to really help without contact. I wish I could offer more, but I, but again, I come back to the fact that parents know best. I mean, you know best, you do trust your gut, trust your instinct and step up and, you know, try something. And if it doesn't, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know, you set that aside and you try something else. It's okay. You, you know, there's so much to learn from failure. So you, you're, you're, if, again, if you're coming from the heart, you're coming from a, a thoughtful space, um, you reflect back on, on what, has worked with your child and you try and you take the data and say, okay, that piece of it worked and that piece of it didn't. I'll try it at a different time tomorrow. I'll try a different activity tomorrow or I'll try something else this afternoon. But, but if you can couch it in what your child is most comfortable in um, and with that, you know, that'll be a good place to start. I love that. And I love how you come with such compassion and I want to highlight something that you mentioned. Parents, you know best, right? A lot of times we see teachers or schools or, or some sort of organizations, like they know much better and we, feel over, we can feel overwhelmed. I mean, I've seen it. I've seen it happen to my parents, to friends. And at the end of the day, we, you know, our intuition is there and we're all doing the best we can and just try. And then when you're talking about trying, if that doesn't work, we'll try something else. It makes me think of, you know, if you all had, if you had children, there were moments where the baby was crying. And what is the, what do you do when the baby's crying? You try something. That doesn't work. You try something else. Some people right. go around on a drive and have the baby and they're like, oh, he's finally asleep. All right. Yep. We just yep. try and try and try yeah. and try. And the close, and the more you fail, the closer you'll get. So it yep. kind of reminds me of that and kind of play with it. I, I yep. love I keep thinking back on, I believe it was Jeff who asked the question about co-parenting and um, in his question, he referred to online schooling and how that is taking priority, I believe he said. And I, it's still in my head that I, that I heard this because I think here is where parents are so important. So these children are being given this work, whether it's coming in through meetings, whether it's coming in through Google Classroom, it's coming in through packets that you have to pick up or that are sent to you. Um, ultimately, as I've said in this calls, these calls, before, you're the parent, but you're also now the teacher, you're the principal, you're the disciplinarian, you're the school building, you're the superintendent, you're all of it. And I believe that what parents should do is take what's coming into their home and make decisions about what does get done and how it gets done. So, you know, taking your child um, who has to learn times tables and letting them do a packet, a, a handout, or going into the kitchen and using things in the kitchen to multiply, or going outside and, and, and um, jumping rope to a rhythm of, of multiplication, or uh, bouncing a ball, or um, counting the number of things in a home, like putting them in, creating in a sense an array and showing them how to multiply and have the visual with the, and the tactile with, with, the, with the work. And then just say to the teacher, here's the proof, here's the evidence. My child learned this, videotape it, send it to the teacher, here it is. My child learned this. We have to make, we have to make this schooling fun um, and meaningful. And a lot of what kids are getting has no, has no importance. There's no importance. <laughs> it's just busy work because teachers are trying to fill hours of a day because that's what their union has told them. That's what their, their principal has told them. That's what they're, even frankly, what some parents are demanding. But why? You know, what are we trying to do here? And also let's think about the fact that there's so many other things that kids are learning right now. What, what, it, what drives me crazy, it's the things that, that schools call soft skills learning to be resilient, learning to be flexible, learning to be a critical thinker, learning, learning to organize their space, learning to uh, be responsive to others, to negotiate and express their needs and so on and so forth. There's so many valuable life lessons that children are, are absorbing right now 
that for me take precedent. If I can build in the reading, the writing, the math and the articulation, great, that's important. But what is really important is those life skills. This generation potentially will come into their adulthood with skills that generations before them did not come into the world with because of and this moment right now and what we are learning. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take your sentence a step further, Karen, because you said, you know, in your opinion, first of all, you get to a stage in your career where you get a right for it not to be just your opinion anymore, right? So you have the ability, as far as I'm concerned, to say this is right. But I'm gonna kind of reinforce that because this is exactly what my mentality is with, with my children. We're, and I didn't turn off my notifications because I wasn't uh, supposed to be on here, so I apologize. Mm -hmm. But I, we are, our children are going to live in a world of artificial intelligence, machine learning, automations, and drones. So if anybody's on this call worrying about their math capability, don't worry. Excel's going to do it for them. If you're worried about how well they can spell, seriously, don't worry. That's sorted. If I start typing one line of an email, Google today, not in five or 10 years time, will automatically start filling out the rest. And it is spooky how accurate it is, even to the vernacular, the concepts, the terms I use. What the people that will succeed in the next generation are the people that have the ability to, to tell a story, to take data sets, to take big complex data and explain it to other humans in ways that can be made decisions can be made. People that have the ability to sit in a room of 10 people and harness their various different energies and bring them into a state where they can reach a collaboration and move forward. These are the things that, are, that were before this, mm -hmm. in my, and I'm going to say in my opinion because I'm not an educator, but I am a technologist and I can see where technology is going. And we hear people say, yeah, artificial intelligence, you know, farmers, truck drivers, you know, more um, white collar, um, sorry, blue collar traditionally. But last year, MIT beat Harvard Law for the first time in a 20 year running experiment of who could win the more cases taking from a random cases from a live docket, who could win more cases, MIT or Harvard arguing with a real judge and jury, and MIT won. So if you think this is, if anyone's on this saying, yeah, you know, AI, yes, yeah, it's gonna replace the people in the fields or the farmers, no, 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 it's coming for all of us. Um, and the people that succeed will be the people that have flexibility. The other thing I wanted to say, there were so many things you're saying, I was like, I really want to say something about that, <laughs> is if I was to put two words on top of what Karen's saying, and I'm going to go maybe for, maybe for three, but let's just stick with two. It's creativity and forgiveness. Yeah. Right? You're going to get it wrong. On behalf of every parent listening, as a parent, you're gonna screw it up. You're gonna screw it up consistently and probably on a, you probably measure it in minutes, not hours, where you go, oh, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Because as soon as you get comfortable, guess what, your kids, who are <laughs> models of you, will find ways to make you uncomfortable again. <laughs> throw and, your curveball. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I heard a great phrase the other day, said life does not throw you curveballs. Life is a curveball. There is no, natural state that things return to after the departure it's all a bit of a mess and jess you're absolutely right i my first child you know the the only way to get her to sleep quite literally sometimes was to drive for about an hour and a half you know and it's okay if that's what it is that's okay you know be critical of your behavior in a non-emotional non-ego way look back and evaluate what you did and go now nah, i could have done that better but please 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 forgive yourselves Every time you, you screw up, it's not as bad as you think it is. 99 times out of 100, they are, children are insanely resilient. They will get over pretty much everything if you consistently strive to be better and just be creative with it. But I think yeah. that's what you were saying. I just wanted to bring that in. I, I think the I could have done it better is something that you should be saying very often. And, um, and through that, I could have done it better is, okay, so I will do it better, or at least I will do it differently, and that might be better, right? Yeah. Um, and I think you're, you're right to say that um, all of life is a curveball. <laughs> I love that. I love that, that uh, reflection. Thank you for that. Yeah. So, yeah. so welcome, Alex. So, Jess, I'll let you go back to it. I just uh, speak, looking at hearing what was just being said from a technology perspective. 
it's it you know they are soft skills not hard skills because soft skills by their nature the term you know they can't be measured that's what it means it's not that they're lessened um but again almost every single employer i know hires on soft skills not on hard skills right so peter though i'll as an educator i'll step back into that soft skills can't be measured um be, that's the excuse that educators are using okay. to to avoid them ah, to, not, to not look at them to not step up to them to not honor them to not uh give space for them and so that's where my my uh struggle is yeah uh, my we had a my daughter came back from one of and literally we're talking about five years old came back from a parent teacher thing um and she said you know olivia's amazing you know, I wouldn't say she's top in anything, but she's great at everything. And I said, literally, the teachers looked at me in, in horror. I said, what about kindness? There and she go. went, oh, she's top of the charts. She sees someone fall over on the other side of the playground. She'll run to pick them up and give them a hug. And I said, cool, we're, we're done. And she went, sorry. And I said, I'm not going to waste any more of your time. We can leave. And she went, I beg, beg your pardon? Went, no, I wanted to review her math. So I'm like, no, 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 no. She's five. She can add up two and three. She can spell cat, dog, fish, bone. She can tell me what she wants for dinner. And she can tell me what's hurting on a various part of her body when she falls over. And you just told me she's willing to run across a playground to give someone a hug. Mm -hmm. I don't need anything more. That's fine. I'll speak to you next term. Right, right. And if we took away the concept of measure, and we said we can we we can see and collect data, um, and we can we can express uh, what we see in children narratively. Then we and I know this firsthand because it's what we do in our school. We talk about children's ability to be kind, to be empathetic, to um, to to think deeply, uh, to explore new ideas, to take risk. And, and that should be a part of every, ch if you're going to evaluate children, then that must be key to evaluation because these are key to our future, not just our children's future, our future as well. Yeah, I want to raise somebody that I want to spend time with and I want yeah. other people to want to spend time with. And on top of that, maybe layer some academic skills, right? It's when I was asked what my goals were for my son, I said, um, charisma, compassion, and common sense. Mm -hmm. And I said, and he's not that smart. And they went, you can't say that. And I went, why? Some of the most miserable people I've ever met in my life are some of the smartest academic people that I know. Some of the happiest people I know, quite frankly, are dumb as rocks. Mm -hmm. But they have charisma, right? You want to spend time with them. You want to go for a drink with them. You want to engage with them. You want to talk to them. They have compassion when you're sharing something, they actually feel your pain. And they have great common sense that keeps them alive. I'm like, that'll do. And actually, it turns out he isn't that dumb anyway. But um, <laughs> charisma, compassion, and common sense. And, and to me, and I, I said this, and, and your point was far more important, but the other side to this, and I ask anybody that's employed anybody, yes, people have to have in certain jobs a specific qualification at a specific hard skill but the differentiators in your employees and your colleagues are the soft skills not the hard skills and it might be peter that people are more often now hiring at entry level people who have all those soft skills and have some some sense of what the what the entry level job skills hard skills are required and the employer is willing to train and teach those hard skills because the soft skills are far more important. And far harder to teach as well by the time yes. you get to adulthood. Yes. I have regularly, and again, I know dozens of people that have regularly taken someone with a lesser academic qualification mm -hmm. that was part of the football club, was, was on the debate society, ran for class president, did all the an other activities over somebody that had the top mark that didn't engage in their university at all. And I know now we're talking about a lot later on in our child's lives, but those traits start right back there of being exploratory and 
wanting to be in a club, not wanting to distance yourself from everyone else so you can get hidden in books. I'm not denying anybody that gets a great grade, congratulations. But you, if you want to stand out talking as a businessman, if you want to stand out to me, it's all the other stuff that you did, not just the grade. Yeah, yeah. And you've all got to see my other background today. Look, this is a, we're not in the studio now. That's great. Oh. <laughs> yes, I'll pass back to you. I'm so sorry. No, thank you so I'm, much. I'm thinking that maybe there are questions we're leaving behind. So we only have about 10 minutes left or so, I think. So no, uh, yeah, we're actually wrapping up. We're trying to keep our calls under like around 45 minutes, uh -huh. just a little over. However, I do have one that I'm going to table for next call. I think we started talking about it um, right now. And thank you so much, Peter, for jumping in. It's such a valuable point. And um, also a little side note, Karen, Jeff is saying thank you so much and that your response was very useful and um, very thought provoking material. Thank you for your insight and your input. Thank you, thank you. You're so welcome. thank you, Jeff, for your You're comment. Welcome. And also I, I can't thank you enough, Karen. Incredible valuable golden hacks for not only us but generations to come so thank you so much You're so welcome. yeah one of the questions i want to ask and you will not answer today we will answer that on our next call <laughs> on thursday because we're talking about soft skills my first thought is like okay great what are the most important oh, soft skills munch, munch, sorry. And with sorry <laughs> 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 One of the most important soft skills that we should be focusing on with our children and how can we be teaching them at home, right? Mm -hmm. So it's so important. So let's talk about that on our next call. What do you say about that, Karen? Yes? Love it. Definitely. We so tune that. in, head on yeah. over to www.hackmankind.com. You will get the schedule every day. And also, once we have the menu of schedule for the week, we're working on a website um, or a page or something. I, Peter will be able to talk about uh, better about that. But um, I know you, there will be a place where you will have the whole schedule, the way to have access to that. And to thank you for just show, showing up at the beginning, the first 1,000 people signing up. And I know there's only a few spots left. So head on over, share with your friends, with your family for free access at hackmankind.com. Again, we want to thank every first responder and frontline responder to um, for everything they're doing, you guys are doing today, and you've always done for us, but especially now putting your lives at risk and the, the ones that, um, that you love as well for us and our health and our well-being. So any teacher, any frontline, so nurses, EMTs, police, uh, law enforcement, and um, firefighter, fire departments, you have lifetime access to uh, hackmankind.com, regardless if it's the first 1,000 people or not. So head on over, hackmankind.com. We'd like to support you, at least the, at the best of our abilities and your families. So thank you so much, Karen. This was such a valuable call. If I did forget, if you were watching this as a recording, please put in your questions on the comments. We'll have a look and answer them on our next call next week. So final thoughts, Karen, before we head on out? I just thank everyone for coming. I love having this, this platform. Um, I love the fact that, you know, so many people are, are really questioning themselves and, 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 and looking for, for, uh, thoughts, ideas, and, and sharing. I love the questions and just keep coming, keep coming and have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful, fun, joyful, thoughtful day. I loved it. Have a fun, filled, joyful day. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for jumping in. Thank you for the whole team. I know some of you are online right now. We have a team of 26, 25, 26 people here supporting you at hackmankind.com. I see some um, wonderful faces and some of you subscribers that are coming on on these calls. Thank you so much. We're here for you. We couldn't do it without you. And we'll see you on the next call. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.